Episode 245 of the Read to Lead podcast is brought to you by Audible. Right now, for a limited time, you can get three months of Audible for just $6.95 a month. That's more than half off the regular price. Go to audible.com slash read to lead or text read to lead, all one word, to 500 500. There's a point where we have to start determining what is best for us individually so that we can maximize how we're uniquely wired and created and lean into that to really bring out our true and best form. Hi, I'm Jeff. Welcome to the Read to Lead podcast. This is the podcast that is dedicated to your personal and professional growth. You see, I believe that if you want to achieve true success in your business and in your life, that intentional and consistent reading is a must. And the Read to Lead podcast is going to help you narrow this ever important reading list as I bring you the golden nuggets, the key insights and main ideas from some of today's most successful and inspiring authors. In just a few minutes, you and I are going to sit down with Thane Marcus Ringler. His brand new book is called From Here to There, A Quarter Life Perspective on the Path to Mastery. Now, I tend to approach personal growth and development books written by 20-somethings with a fair amount of skepticism, as, as may you. My thinking is, what could someone who's spent less than half as much time on Earth as, as me possibly have to teach me, let alone the rest of the world? Well, while I can begin my journey as a skeptic, I'm open-minded enough not to stay there too long should the situation warrant. And I believe such is the case with today's guest, Thane. Uh, let me just say that, that Thane is, is why beyond his years. And I mean that. I was taken aback by the way this guy thinks as I read his new book. And I feel like if I had Thane's level of of self-awareness when I was his age, his level of understanding of life, I'd probably have already served my my two terms as president by, by now. Seriously, though, do yourself a favor and read this book. I'll be asking Thane to share about, among other things, what he calls the five P's to mastery, his thoughts on the differences between education and learning, some of the ways we hinder our ability to learn, and much, much more. Oh, and be sure and stick around later on in the show for a special offer from our sponsor, Audible. Thane Marcus Ringler is an up-and-comer living in Los Angeles, uh, California. After uh, competing as a professional golfer for nearly four years, he transitioned into a new career as an author, lucky for us, and an entrepreneur. Alongside his work in collaborating with other freelancers and entrepreneurs, a combination of coaching, consulting, and creating, by the way, he hosts the Up and Comers Show podcast, all about learning how to live a good life. Well, Thane's brand new book out as of last month is called From Here to There, A Quarter Life Perspective on the Path to Mastery. Thane, welcome officially to the Read to Lead podcast. Thanks so much for having me, Jeff. I'm excited to chat a little bit with you today. Well, you are, I think, the second author I've had on the show who has uh, the phrase quarter life in the the subtitle of their book. And as a quarter lifer times two, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm always skeptic. I'm always a little reluctant as to what someone half my age has to teach me. But I have to honestly say, and I'm not trying to brown nose or, or butter you up, I was blown away by the level of wisdom uh, that I am gleaning from your book. So so kudos to you for uh, packing a punch. <laughs> well, I am, I am very humbled and honored to hear that, Jeff. Honestly, it, it really warms my heart. And- and um, I, I thank you for those kind words and just so glad that it is worth reading. <laughs> you never, when you're writing, it's very subjective, right? And so to hear objective feedback that is positive is always a blessing. Well, I want to start off by asking you sort of that big picture goal type question as it relates to the book. What, what do you hope to accomplish ultimately by having, having written it? You know, it's interesting, the journey of writing, uh, your goals kind of change as you go about it. Also, the content kind of changes as you go about it. So it originally started out as a book about how golf teaches you about life and makes you a better person in life. And as I wrote it, it definitely turned into more of a general overarching 
looking at the path to mastery and pursuing excellence in any field um, and then relaying the mental models or frameworks for that. And so it was interesting how the book itself kind of transformed as I wrote it. And then my goals with it has also kind of changed. I mean, initially it was to provide a way to say thank you to my investors and sponsors that backed me in the professional golf journey. And then as I wrote it and as I finished it and as I've seen it through to the finish line, it's really turned into trying to execute well on a book launch and have it reach as many people's hands as possible. And also, I think what's been interesting in the last couple months as I've thought about the book and the concepts and even the time of life that we're in now, I think that more than ever before, there is this quarter life crisis that is going on with young adults in America as we are bombarded by more information than ever before and more distractions than ever before. And so I think I think it can also serve as a really helpful source of information for people who are facing a quarter life crisis to provide them just information about the path ahead to help us better travel that path. Well, this next question is not one I often hit on, but I really appreciate a well structured book. And I really like how From Here to There is is structured. Uh, I was wondering if you could share why you structured it the way you did and, and how you structured it from the, the phases down to the individual chapters. Yeah, well, thank you. It, we get inspiration from others and imitation is the highest form of flattery. And so I, I have to give a lot of credit to Jocko Willink. I don't know if you've heard of mm, him, but yeah. his book, Extreme Ownership, he was, the, he was a Navy SEAL team captain for the team that was in Ramadi uh, during, I don't know if you know the movie American Sniper. Mm-hmm. He was the, the SEAL team leader for that team. An amazing leader, um, a really inspirational guy. And uh, his book, Extreme Ownership, was formatted in a very similar way. He basically shared war illustrations. He, he shared the, the principle. And then he shared a business application for each chapter. And I loved that flow because it was very engaging, but also memorable and relatable. And so I I basically mirrored that and took it as a golf illustration, the concept, and then life application with um, my own subject matter. And and then the overarching structure really stemmed from this phrase that I had kind of become captivated by that says, um, simplicity on the far side of complexity and referring to mastery as that far side simplicity. Um, And that kind of gave me this 50,000 foot view of what the path and process of development looks like, which is simplicity, complexity, simplicity. And then from that, I wanted to break down into those smaller mental models that that kind of fit into each phase um, of that process of development. And and it goes kind of from a 50,000 foot view to maybe a 20,000 foot view and kind of hangs out there um, and then provide smaller pieces of information in the middle of that. But honestly, you know, sometimes structure we also just stumble upon <laughs> and and a lot of the, the chapter content, um, the overarching structure of those mental models, I really stumbled upon. I, I had been reading all that I'd written for about a month trying to figure out what this book was going to be about. And when I finally was like, I need to get started, I actually ended up just saying, okay, what could this book be about? And I jotted down probably six or seven different topics of what the book could be on. And as I sat there and kind of pondered and thought about it, my subconscious finally connected the fact that each of these quote unquote books could be a chapter within the book. And that kind of started forming those, Mm. those mental models or frameworks. Uh, I love that. And I think too, that the way you've structured it, particularly the individual chapters greatly increases the likelihood that the person reading it is going to walk away knowing exactly what they need to do to, to, to change, to make a difference, to actually apply what they're, what they're learning. So kudos to you on that. Thank you. I have a couple of favorite quotes from the book that, that really stick out to me that I want you to kind of unpack. And, and one of those from the very first chapter is this, understanding what mastery is, what it entails, and, and why it's worth pursuing is vital to living a life well. It's a non-negotiable in becoming your best for the world's greatest good. Yeah, there's a great quote by Theodore Roosevelt. And he said that the greatest gift of life is the ability to, to work hard at work worth doing. And and that's really true. And, and honestly, I think for us to, you know, one of the things I like to share, and as you saw in the book, is that information is really what helps eliminate chaos. Without good information, usually it's going to be a really bumpy and chaotic road wherever we're going. <laughs> and so just providing 
good information about what to expect and what the process entails and what what is the experience is going to feel like is really going to be helpful for traveling down that road and and ultimately like pursuing work worth doing is going to be the most fulfilling for us individually and the most beneficial for those around us and we all have an individual level or type of mastery that we can pursue within our own lives and within our own fields. It may not be called mastery by the world, Mm. um, but it can be mastery for you. And I think that that's what's really important is just taking individual ownership of your own life in that. As I work with others and coach and and mentor others, uh, I was, uh, with that in mind, particularly intrigued by uh, what you call the five P's of mastery, this this uh, sort of roadmap that is crucial for success. Can, can can you talk about those a bit? Yeah, and it's cool because when you when you think about this illustration of of driving somewhere, or going on a journey, it gives you a lot of these parallels that we can connect to life. So, but yeah, understanding you know the first one is purpose and really having that be your foundation, your why, right? We hear that a ton. It's, <laughs> there's a reason why we hear it a ton because it's so important. Your purpose doesn't happen by chance. You have to be intentional in your design of that. You have to really get clear about why it is what you do so that when you wake up in the morning, you ha- are on mission. You are on mission in alignment with your vision and you're doing everything to further that goal, right? And when they're attached to it, everything can be done to a greater extent with more purpose and more meaning. So the first P is purpose. Um, which is really the foundation for everything. The second P is preparation. And and being prepared well will help us travel the best down the road, right? And that looks just like daily doing the best we can at every aspect of our lives. And that means including resting well, right? Resting well (laughs) is a really important part of preparation. And then it gets into process. So understanding the process for what's involved helps us better, again, be prepared for it because everything entails a process. And honestly, we're all in process throughout all of our lives. We're in process somewhere and we're on a spectrum in that. Something I've been talking about a lot recently is those two realities that are interesting to think about um, in a, on a spectrum between two polar realities and in process towards something. Mm-hmm. And so recognizing the steps in that process. The fourth is patience. The fourth and fifth ones are really the the truth to preach to ourselves (laughs) along the way. And that is patience and persistence. Mm. Um, Because we, we are, like you said, in different stages of the journey. Um, and I think that the the resounding theme that us younger generations need to hear is just patience and persistence. You know, nothing happens by chance. Nothing happens overnight. And it takes a lot of patience and persistence to see any vision through to reality. So that's, that's constantly the truth that I'm having to preach to myself. And I, I know that most of those in these younger generations and really throughout all of our lives, I think just being patient with the process and persisting with our effort is, is so crucial. If you've listened to Read to Lead for any length of time, you know that one of the questions that I'll be asking Thane a little bit later is to recommend some of his favorite books. Before I give him the chance to do that, I wanted to recommend a book myself that I'm really enjoying listening to in particular via Audible, an app that I've been using for, uh, gosh, I've, I've lost track of how many years, probably seven or eight years or thereabouts. And the book I'm listening to as of late is called Atomic Habits, James Clear. It's one I highly recommend, and I've actually purchased that book for about a dozen or so of my friends. And it makes me think of one of my favorite aspects of Audible. With your membership, you get a free book credit every month. And about every three or four months, I'll think, oh, let me me check my my credits in, in Audible. And invariably, I'll have several that I've accumulated but not used yet. It's like Christmas or, or, or my birthday. All of a sudden, I've got three or four or five books coming my way because I've got those credits I'd forgotten about. You love listening to podcasts about books. I bet you'd love listening to books too. If you don't already have an Audible membership. Here's a great reason to try it out right now. For a limited time, and I do mean limited, you can get three months of Audible for just $6.95 a month. That's more than half off the regular price. And here's the easy to remember URL, audible.com slash read to lead. That's audible.com slash read to lead. Or you can text from your phone, the phone you're probably listening to this episode on right now. Just text the phrase read to 
to lead, no spaces, to 500, 500. That's read to lead, no spaces, to 500, 500. Never again will you find yourself in your car, on a plane, or anywhere else without being able to make valuable use of that time because you'll have a plethora of books at the ready. Do yourself a favor. Check out Audible now. Audible.com slash read to lead or text read to lead, no spaces, to 500 500. I know you're a fan of, of James Clear. We were privileged to have him on the show just a, a couple of weeks ago. And and to the ideas of, of preparation and process, he says something similar to uh, the Greek poet that you cited. Uh, James' uh, take on it is we don't rise to the level of our goals. We, we fall to the level of our systems. Is that something you subscribe to? 100%. Yeah, no, I, I love James. He's got s- some great work and has really impacted me as well. And, and it's true, you know, systems are so massively important. You know, my sixth chapter is all about systems. And really, you know, goals are great and they, they need to be in front of us. But again, you have to have a system in place, which is like a proven process for accomplishing those goals that you can implement whether you feel like it or not, because goals can often rest on inspiration or motivation and that can be fleeting sometimes. And so having those systems that you default to when you don't feel like it can be really helpful. And and I think too, what's really important in understanding systems is really the key to unlocking that far side simplicity, that personal mastery, that pursuit of personal mastery, which is a movement from universal systems or principles into individual systems and principles. Mm. And, and that's really the shift that we all have to make to open up that door because we need to learn the general truisms in any field or pursuit or skill from those who have already gone before us that have done it well, that are generally true to everyone in, in, in that field, right? That's really important. And there's a lot to learn. It's a mass sea of complexity in that. <laughs> but there's a point where we have to start determining what is best for us individually so that we can maximize how we're uniquely wired and created um, and lean into that to really bring out our true and best form. Mm, as it has to do with uh, commitment that you dive into in chapter two, I think it is, and the cost that comes with it. Uh, another one of my favorite quotes uh, from that chapter is stop giving yourself a way out, no matter how wise it feels, because that wisdom is largely tied to comfort and comfort tends to stunt our growth more than foster it. Would you expound on that? Yeah, it's a tough one. It's a really <laughs> important subject. Commitment is so vital. It's necessary. And and I, you know, I've learned this through failure, <laughs> just like we all, right? I mean, my first year of professional golf, it was something my, my collegiate coach had, had told me quite a bit. You know, when you ask anybody who's successful and as a professional golfer, you ask them, what would you do if you're not golfing? They don't have an answer <laughs> because they're sold out. They're 100 hundred percent committed. And really the first six months to a year of my professional career, I had an answer. You know, I had kind of a plan B or even I wouldn't call it a plan B. I'd call it a plan A.5. <laughs> but even that it's deceivingly wise, right? Because you're allowing yourself a way out. You're allowing yourself room for doubt and fear and uncertainty to creep into your mind. And really when you're doing anything challenging, you can't have that be a part of the process because that will lead to limitations on your what you produce the products you produce the work you do i mean i experienced that in golf you know if i'm not fully sold out then i have room for doubt and in golf it is in your head 100 percent of the time right and Mm -hmm. so you have to leave no possibility for doubt to creep into the mind now it doesn't mean complete blind commitment right it needs to be informed commitment but it also has to be commitment over a long enough period of time to really truly evaluate the fruit if i'm only committed to something for two weeks, I don't know if I can really have a great sample size to know Mm. the true fruit of that endeavor. And so it does take persisting for a long enough time, committing for a long enough time. And and then there's a great book by Seth Godin called The Dip. And in that, he talks about the period of time where we are in this dip after we've been committed for a period of time and we've reached this really hard period in the process. And that's really the period where we have to decide, are we going to quit or are we going to stick it out? And he does a great job in that book of breaking it down. Um, but that's that's a point that we all get to. And um, and that's when we get to make the decision of quit or stick. But up until that point, we really need to be committed. 
And commitment doesn't mean that once you make a decision, you you can't go back, right? That would be one of the myths that you talk about. Yeah, it's so important. I think that's why we're we're so hard for us to be committed is because we have that fear of dead ends, right? (laughs) That fear of if I go down this road and spend so many hours and so many days pursuing X or Y or Z and I end up hitting a dead end, right? It doesn't succeed. It fails. Um, it, It doesn't accomplish what I'd set out to. Well, then I have to go to the start again. And and the reality is that is a lie. It's not <laughs> true. I played golf my whole life, right? Over 20 years of my life and played professionally for three and a half years. And the biggest fear in that commitment was, well, what if I waste all of these years? Mm. But the reality was, once I did reach the end of my career about a year ago, I was able to take a few steps back, pivot, pick a new trajectory, and start moving forward with all the ground that I had gained. Pursuing golf to the best of my ability is what prepared me to write the book well and provide the content well, and now to coach others well and to speak well and to communicate these ideas because I had faithfully pursued golf. So whatever you're doing, if you do it to the fullest, 100% commitment, it'll prepare you for whatever's in front of you, whether or not it's in that same field. I love that. I think so many people need to hear that message. Uh, One of my favorite chapters in the book uh, is simply called Learning. And I'd love for you to compare and contrast what you've come to understand, Thane, as the difference between education and learning. Mm, yeah, super important too. Because <laughs> honestly, I I unfortunately didn't learn how to learn until halfway through college, mm. um, and so many of us we assume that education is what learning is. And really, if you even look at the words, right, learning is something that you fight to accomplish. Education is a gift that you receive, and anything that you receive, it is passive, meaning there's not as much effort going on. It's not an active pursuit, mm. and the game of education, we can get, I got really good at the game of education, which is getting good grades, right? But that doesn't mean you're actually getting good at learning. And the overarching principle, there's a great book, uh, Make It Stick by Peter Brown. Um, That just has some great, and there's a couple others on learning, but that's a great one for just practical learning strategies. But the overarching theme that really is important to understand when it comes to learning, the path of most resistance always equals the path of most learning. So the things that's the hardest on your mind (laughs) and on your thought process on engaging with the material, that's the thing that's going to make it stick and make it last and and turn into true learning the most, which is tough because we don't like that, right? It's not comfortable. (laughs) It's not fun. But that's where the fruit really lies. What would you say are some of the ways, Thane, that we often uh, hinder our ability to learn? Are there some some patterns you've, you've picked up on or noticed? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's our human nature, right? We're inherently lazy a lot of times. So if we don't, if we don't have intention, I guess, I guess if it's not attached to our why, if we don't have a reason why we're learning something, we're not going to learn it. I mean, I, I tried to pick up another language. I wanted to learn another language. So I was like, oh, I'll just learn German. My grandpa's German. So, hey, got Rosetta Stone and it lasted a month, of course. You know, like I had no reason why. Mm to learn. And so it didn't stick. So I think having a why, having it attached to your purpose is what will really enable us to fight well. Um, And then, yeah, just overcoming our lazy tendencies. It takes intention. It takes effort. But I think I think the other aspect of it is it's just our habits, right? Mm. Once we have the habit of not really learning or just vegging out. And again, TV's great, shows are great, but um, a lot of times that's more of a veg than it is a learning time. Mm -hmm. Um, And so if we build the habit one way, it's going to take more effort to build the habit in the other way, just like James talks a lot about. And so to to re kind of arrange and reorganize our habits, it, it takes a lot of fighting up front, but in the end, it compounds and starts, you get the momentum on your own side and you can start the ball rolling. And then it really does just add up progressively as you get better at it. I think about uh, when I was your age, how much television I watched and how different my life would look today if if I began applying the principles I live by today when I was your age. Uh, it's kind of like investing, you know. <laughs> if I had just yeah. started when I was younger, uh, overheard my wife in a phone conversation recently. Uh, it was her sister, I think, recommending uh, that we watch some show together. And I, w- I felt so proud when I heard my wife say, Jeff doesn't do 
TV. <laughs> <It's> <laughs> like, I've, I've finally, finally made it. I'm, I'm doing something right. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I, I feel like our time has gone by really quickly. I do have a couple of other questions I want to ask you, Thane, not directly related to the book. And I feel like we just scratched the surface with the book itself. But before I get to those other questions, is there anything else from the book you want to make sure that we, we walk away with? Yeah, I think I think we've talked about commitment and learning, but the the other one that is really important is just that failure is likely. You know, if you're pursuing anything that's challenging, anything that's beyond your current grasp, there's a really good likelihood that failure is going to be a part of that process. And failure is our greatest tutor, so it's not an enemy to run away from. It's really a friend to embrace because it's teaching us what not to do, so that we can learn what to do to be successful. And and really, the overarching theme of my book is is twofold. And, and the, the pillars that I'm really trying to communicate are one, just to take ownership individually of our lives and two, to never settle for less than we're capable of. And that's really something that, man, if, if we can all take ownership and never settle individually, it'll be amazing what can happen societally and globally as we um, lean into those things. Well, I want to ask you about books. You mentioned uh, Make It Stick by Peter Brown earlier, so maybe that's one of them. But I want you to to put your thinking cap on for a minute, Thane, and think about the books that you've read uh, over the last uh, few years. Uh, what would you say are maybe the two or, or even three titles that immediately come to mind as having had, had a big impact on you? Uh, yes, I love books. <laughs> and it's always hard picking a few. Um <laughs> Fierce Conversations by Susan Scott is a really, really good book Mm. on just having powerful conversations with others that really examine reality together. I mean, those are, you know, the uncomfortable conversations are the ones that we should and need to be having because it's what helps us grow again. So that's a great book for kind of thinking through that. I just finished one by Dan and Chip Heath called Shift, and it's all about making change. And they have some really, just a really good framework that they created for thinking about change. They, they talk about the writer, the elephant, and the path are the three important parts of that. And so just a really helpful book in thinking through change. And then one more, the one I'm reading right now that is blowing my mind is How We Got to Now by Stephen Johnson. And it's six innovations that shape the modern world. The first chapter is all about silicon dioxide, which is glass. And um, when you when you melt it or heat it and then freeze it, it turns into glass. And, and that is the invention that I think has, I mean, they make the case that it has completely changed the world that we live in. And it blew my mind how many ways it had. So mm. if you want something that's kind of, um, he's, he's very much a horizontal thinker, and then he also takes a very big picture perspective. So it's a, it's a great eye opener. Mm. Well, as a, as a speaker, uh, what would you say, Thane, on something you're wanting to do more of and get better at, what would you say are some of your tips for delivering uh, an impactful and memorable public talk if you could pour into someone who wanted to get better at that skill? Yeah, I mean, I'm in that process as well. So <laughs> I think I don't want to, to speak from a level of, of mastery in that yet. But I guess the advice that I would give that I'm giving myself is just reps, you know, repetitions. Mm-hmm doing it a lot and then uh, getting good feedback from others of like what's truly sticking. Again, we can't see that really objectively with by ourselves. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think the the third is to speak from what you've lived. If you can speak from what you've experienced and what you've lived and what you've been through and do it not in a self-glorifying but a humble way, like that's, that's usually the material that people are really going to resonate with. It's the most authentic, of course. Well, now that the, uh, the book is out beyond promoting it, in doing interviews like this one, uh, what would you say is ahead for you and your team that, that you're excited about? You know, I'm excited just to continue building. This year's been building a lot. Um, and so this next year, there's some exciting projects on the horizon that I'm really stoked about. Going to be creating more speaking opportunities and curriculum for college to career transition. So that'll be a really neat project. And and I think I'm just really excited about growing in my platform and presence and, and voice to this younger generation, to these 20s and 30s that I'm a part of. And really, one of the things I I love speaking about, Jeff, is this idea of generational roles in society. And I think that the younger generation's role is always to be the idealists 
in society because the older we get, the naturally cynicism kind of creeps in because life doesn't stack up to our hopes and dreams. <laughs> but that's an important balance. And, and I think that the caveat and something that, that I'm really thankful for golf instilling in me is the importance of self-discipline. Because without self-discipline, idealism isn't helpful. Idealism is only helpful by marrying it with self-discipline that embraces a daily realism, understanding that the only way ideals become reality is with patience and persistence <laughs> over a long period of time. And so I, I think just that that concept of discipline is something that I am so passionate about and excited to, to, to relay to more people. Mm. Well, Thane's uh, book, again, is called From Here to There, A Quarter-Life Perspective on the Path to Mastery. It is indeed possible, dare I say, to learn from someone younger than you, even when he's half your age. And yes, I speak from experience. Thane, thank you so much for taking time out to be with us today. I really appreciate it and you sharing uh, your, your wisdom. Thank you so much for the kind words, Jeff. This has been a lot of fun. I appreciate it. See, I wasn't kidding when I said there's tons of wisdom in that 20-something brain of his. Loving the book and loving getting to know Thane as well. He mentioned the book by Chip and Dan Heath. He called it Shift a moment ago. The book he meant to say, and I know this because I know Chip and Dan's books very, very well, he was referring to Switch. I'll link to that in the show notes along with the other books and resources he and I referenced. All that can be found at readtoleadpodcast.com slash 245 for episode 245. And don't forget, for a limited time, you can get three months of Audible for just six ninety five dollars a month. That's more than half off the regular price. Go to audible.com slash read to lead or text read to lead to 500 500. That's audible.com slash read to lead or text read to lead. No spaces to 500 500. If you have comments or questions or feedback about the show, you can leave those at the show notes page I referenced a moment ago, or you can email me directly, Jeff at read to lead podcast.com. Well, that does it for this week. I look forward to seeing you next time. Until then, remember, leaders read and readers lead. 